Hey, Tim O'Neill. Oh man, it's it's a it's a pleasure. It's an honor. We both love cricket, so automatically know me and you would bond. You know, as a, as a young boy in Jamaica, a lot of people don't know this about me. I was such a good cricket player at a young age. I was one of the youngest guys to ever make the Kingston Cricket Club. And I used wow. to go to Woolmers, and Woolmers boys produce five to six straight wicket keepers for the West Indies team. Yeah. Well, and I went to that same high school. Jeffrey Dijon was the last one, I think, if I pronounce his name right. Well, so here's a little history about me. Nobody in my community knows. But um, I, I, I always said my life would have been different if I never came to America. I probably would have ended up in England playing cricket. Playing cricket. Yeah, yeah I would be making some money, some good money. Yeah. You know? But, hey, I ended up here in America, wanted to be a Christian, wanted to be a pastor. I was actually a born again Christian, and then I came here, and then now I entered to this entered into this community called a conscious community. I, I threw the Bible out, threw the Quran out, threw um, Nation of Islam teachings out, and then I started to study Kemet. Then I started to study the Bible. I was this whole Horus is Jesus guy for like five to eight years. I was uh -huh. doing that, and then you know. I'm I'm where I'm at today, but uh, <laughs> but that's my life. <laughs> but, well, maybe uh, look, thanks yeah. thanks for thanks for asking me on the show. Maybe I should just sort of, for those who don't know who the hell I am, I could give you a little bit of background on me because um, one of the things I need to stress is that I'm an atheist, and and some of the people who don't like uh, some of the stuff I have to say like to try and slander me and say that I'm. Uh, and you're pretending to be an atheist or I'm actually a Christian. I actually had someone send me an email saying, um, do you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? He was trying to catch me out as um, as, a, as a fake atheist who was really a Christian. So being an Australian, we're pretty good at, at um, blasphemy and obscenity. And so I sent him a, an email reply that had blasphemy that probably would have peeled the paint off the walls of his room and um, I never heard from him again. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely uh, definitely an atheist, and um, uh, like you, I do like cricket. Unlike you, I'm I'm probably one of the worst cricket players in the world. Uh, my brothers used to laugh uh, at how bad I was. I loved it. I loved trying to play, but I was just terrible. Um, they they called me the world's worst all rounder. Uh, those who know cricket will know what what that means. Basically, means I can't bat, can't bowl, and can't catch. Um, but I like watching it uh, while drinking while drinking a cold beer on a summer's day. Um, as far as my background is concerned, I, I wasn't ever a, a, a really sort of committed Christian. I was kind of raised in a, in a Christian family, but um, abandoned Christianity pretty pretty quickly in my in my late teens. And by the time I went to university, I was an atheist, and uh, a few years of philosophy, studying philosophy, and certainly studying history was really what. Um, finished off any kind of religious belief that I may have had. Uh, the reason studying history was was part of that was that I suppose the reason my path towards sort of atheism was actually through history. Um, uh, quite quite young, I, I was uh, when I was still at high school. I found myself sitting on the sort of the sidelines of a of a debate or, or a conversation, um, kind of at lunch lunchtime at, at, at school between our schools most fundamentalist Baptist Christian and this guy who was a, he called himself an agnostic. And she kept coming up with the usual Christian arguments. Jesus said this and Jesus did that and Jesus was this other thing. And he kept asking the question, how do you know? And she would say, well, it's in the Gospels, it's in the Bible. And he would say, yeah, but who wrote that and when? And this was a question, these were questions I'd never actually asked. I was only about 16 at the time. And so I'd, I'd, I thought, he asked some good questions, even though I was probably at that stage more um, inclined towards what she believed. I thought she did a really bad answer, a good job of answering them. So I thought if someone challenges me on that stuff, I want to be able to answer those questions. So that started me off on uh, reading about the origins of Christianity. I had the, the good luck of being at a school with, uh, with a very good library and also with some teachers who, without steering me in any particular, towards any particular answer, helped me. Um, with with how to examine history, how to study history, 
and and that really kind of led me to to abandoning Christianity and abandoning um, and and abandoning any belief in God. So that's me. Um, why history for atheists? Uh, I, I'm really flattered that you've invited me on a series about scholars. Uh, I, I should say that, except in the broader sense, I'm not actually a scholar. I, I have a, a master's degree, but it's in um, medieval literature. I've studied I studied history at, at uh, university level in my undergraduate degree, um, but I'm an amateur. And and what I do in in my my website, History for Atheists, is try to examine some of the claims that many atheists make about history that they actually get wrong. I think if we're going to be um, rationalist, if we're going to if we're going to talk about examining evidence, being objective, or trying to be uh, paying attention to the consensus of experts, then we should actually do that. And unfortunately, a lot of not not all, but a lot of atheists, including some very prominent ones like Dawkins, Hitchens, Sam Harris, make claims about history which are wildly wrong, which no historian would accept. Others also um, uh, are quite prominent in in presenting theories about history which most historians reject and jesus mythicism which we're going to talk about today is one of those now the fact that most scholars reject jesus mythicism doesn't mean that it's wrong and i'm not saying that because it's the majority and it is an overwhelming majority of of scholars don't find mythicism convincing that doesn't mean that mythicism is therefore wrong that's an argument from authority but i'm i'm noting a consensus because consensus actually counts for something so what i'm doing with history for atheists is um, saying to to my fellow atheists if you're going to use history if you're going to make arguments about religion based on history you've got to get it right and so if you're claiming that christians burned down the great library of alexandria that's wrong so don't make arguments based on the idea that Christians burned down the Great Library of Alexandria. Don't make arguments based on the idea that Galileo was persecuted because you know they, they, the church didn't pay any attention to science because that's wrong. Um, so there's there's a whole lot of these myths that I, I have on my uh, my my, my um, website, um, and I have a, a separate section on Jesus mythicism because that's one of the ones that people keep asking me about. And I think, you know, I've done quite a few of these interviews on various YouTube channels. I think about half of them or more are about Jesus mythicism. So that's why I'm here. That's who I am. Um, and I, I think I think it is important for us to look at this stuff objectively. And it was interesting in the conversation, Garfield, that you and I had before we, we started, you were talking about how you didn't believe that there was a historical Jesus and and you were saying it's because you didn't want to accept that there was a yeah, historical because, Jesus, yeah, which but, I found really interesting. Can, yeah, maybe you can talk for, a bit more about that. The last seven years, I've been trying my best to prove Jesus don't exist. Yeah. Now, I know I'm a consensus guy. I normally say the consensus of scholars say this, consensus of scholars say that. And people used to say, well, how, how is it you say the consensus for everything? But when it comes to Jesus, you know, then I'm like, yeah, but I don't know about this biblical guy, you know. But yeah, the yeah. bottom line is, though, I mean, from a scholastic point of view, I think my community is lazy when it comes to methodology. Not everybody, of course. My brother in the chat, Sean, from the Masi Warrior Clan, we call him Mr. Methodology. And a matter of fact, Dr. Joshua Bowen was on last Friday. He's another Mr. Methodology. So you're a, you're a method, Mr. Methodology too. But yeah. by the way, before we get into all of this, do you know why my name is Garfield? No. Is it a reference to the cat? No. <laughs> I thought you were a cricket oh, fan. Sorry, Garfield Sobers. There you go. Oh. How is it this, this white guy from Australia knows this, but nobody in my community knows this? <laughs> oh, man, I tell you. But but um let me let me say this though. Let's get let's get to Jesus for a second. Believing Jesus in my community is like taboo in a sense, in a in a scholastic sense. Yeah. They, they the majority of them believe um that Heru played a role or Horus plays a role in the Jesus character. Osiris plays a role. Egypt plays a role. At the end of the prayers, they say, Amen. Amen has to do with Amen Ra. Um, <laughs> you're laughing. It's funny. 
and, oh, and, yeah. and it is funny and and we believe this and hold it to be true and we've been taught this by our elders so we're saying the elders were right we we appeal to authority and say the elders were right so now I have my 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 guy. My crew, my crew is called the Dagger Squad. So the youth uh -huh. is called Dagger Squad, and we throw daggers at the Bible believers all day. That's what we do, morning, noon, and night. But there's a guy in the chat right now, Black Lion Supreme. That's my partner. That's my right hand man. He don't believe in no historical Jesus, but he did say, out of all the people he has ever listened to, you're the only one that's <laughs> extremely. <laughs> Convincing, he's like Timothy he makes the best argument. He makes the best argument. Uh, I like I like Black Line Supreme already. He sounds like a very clever and and discerning gentleman. Um, yep. Yeah, look, that's really interesting. Um, one of the reasons I was interested in coming on your show because is that I don't have a lot of exposure to to that community. Um, it, it's it's I, I suppose I've been paying a lot more attention to sort of your your hardline atheist. Mm -hmm. um wing of of the of the of the of the kind of the, the mythicist sphere and 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 there's a whole different there's, there's a range of different uh, ways of approaching the, the 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 idea that there was no jesus and one of them is is what's called the astrotheological um approach which mm -hmm. which sounds a little similar to what you're talking about which was sort of exemplified by the woman who called herself a chaya s um the, right. the, the Dor mm -hmm. dorothy murdoch mm -hmm. um I, I i haven't really gone into a lot of detail on that mainly because i find it very difficult to take seriously i mean dorothy murdoch's books are uh, this rambling new age nonsense and I, I just it, it to me it, it's it's kind of a waste of time but also because most of the people that I come across online don't take that stuff seriously. They say Richard Carrier, um, Earl Doherty, uh, all of you know Robert Price. Those guys are the, are the are the gold standard when it comes to mythicist argument. And I would agree that Carrier, in particular, but Price and and, and Doherty as well, really do stick to the kind of methodology that uh, that mainstream scholarship uses. I don't think their arguments are very good. Um, but but they at least are, are working within that 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 framework, whereas people like Achaya S, it, it's sort of the scattergun pulling bits and pieces from all over the place, you know, using 18th, 19th century sources, using using stuff that's based on, on mystical visions and so on. It's it, it, it's very very difficult to take seriously. Um, so I was interested to kind of get yeah to 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 talk to you about it and maybe personally get a little bit of a different perspective but, but back to your point about how you didn't want jesus to exist <laughs> because because a lot of mythicists when they say to me that, that you know they, they don't accept that, that there was a historical jesus at all they they assure me that they've arrived at this from from a purely logical point of view and then when i i discuss it with them or argue with them about it what becomes very clear is that they are working extremely hard to make inconvenient bits of evidence go away, to make certain references, um, to rule them out of court, to, to really strain to make particular arguments work when I think most people looking at them objectively would say, that's a really contrived argument. And it, it seems to me that with many of these people, they're not really being driven by logic. They're being driven by emotion. Many of them are, are former fundamentalist Christians or former Christians like yourself. And, and they're reacting against that that um, indoctrination. And they've kind of gone from one extreme, Jesus is Lord, to the other extreme, there was no Jesus at all. Some of them are people who quite often uh, are, tend to kind of think very in binary terms. They think in black and white. So it's either Jesus was everything Christianity claims or none of that stuff is true, including him existing. And I've got to be careful when I talk about Jesus, I'm using it, the term as a shorthand. So I'm not talking about Jesus Christ, the figure of Christianity, the one who walked on water and rose from the dead and you know, healed people and you know, um, fed the 5,000. I'm talking about a historical Jewish preacher whose name was Yeshua, which was the original form of, of, of his name, and who, who was the point of origin for those later stories. People in the ancient world told miracle stories about all kinds of people. And I would argue, 
it is most likely that that's what's happened with this guy, Yeshua. He was a Jewish preacher who preached an apocalyptic message about the coming end of the world very, very soon. And that morphed into or became developed, evolved into a, a story whereby he was a, a savior. He was the Messiah. He was the savior. And then he was, he was eventually elevated to the position of uh, God in human form and then part of the Trinity and part of God. So when I'm talking about Jesus, I'm talking about that guy, right? I'm talking about a historical Jewish preacher. But I, what I find is that many people find it difficult to separate that guy from the Jesus that they were taught to believe when they were Christians. And so when they reject the Jesus of Christianity, Jesus Christ, they, they feel they have to uh, reject any idea that there was a historical Jesus. And I've actually had people say to me, well, if they're right about him existing, maybe they're right about the other stuff at all, the other stuff as well. And I I just can't comprehend that. But it, it it seems to them like if they admit anything in Christianity is true, then they're on a slippery slope to becoming a Christian again. I've actually had people say that to me several that's times. Why, that's, how, that's what's happening to me now because yeah. I agree with pretty much everything my community says. But from a logical level, saying Jesus is a real person is a problem. Yeah, and gotcha. I think the thing is that I'm wondering is that we don't apply the same pseudo methodology to every character. It's like, for example, I always bring up Manito, right? Because a lot of folks are into Egypt in my community. And I'm saying there's no evidence that Manito existed prior to Josephus writing about him almost 400 years later. Yeah. But yet we have a problem with the information about Jesus being 60 years later or 90 years later. But, yeah. Oh, we trust Manitho. That, oh, that was thorough. That genealogy is right. But yeah. we can't do it with that with, um, when it comes to Jesus. So, so the question of consistency is, I think, is, is a very valid one. And, and this is something that I suppose when I'm talking to and, and discussing this with mythicists, I find myself saying quite a bit. So they, they, they apply these rules to Jesus, some of which are rules that no historian would actually use. And then when I, and I say to them, well, okay, if we apply that rule across the board, then 90% of ancient figures wouldn't exist. So, so it doesn't make sense to apply that rule. That, that's obviously ludicrous. And, and what they're doing is they're coming up with rules that are designed specifically to rule out Jesus. And that's not logical. It doesn't make sense. So one of the ones that, that I hear a lot, um, which, uh, which I come across all the time, is there are no contemporary references to Jesus, which is true. Therefore, he didn't exist, which doesn't logically follow. We have um, no contemporary references to all kinds of people in the ancient world, including some who would have been much more prominent than some peasant Jewish preacher in Galilee. Yet that, so it doesn't follow that, that if there are no contemporary references, they didn't exist. The, the nature of our sources when we're studying ancient history is such that um, the, the, our sources are very fragmentary, often uncertain, usually biased, uh, regularly full of references to supernatural stuff, and quite often late, much later than the person's life, in some cases centuries later. So if we look at uh, the question of how much evidence, and by evidence I'm using it in the term, that, you know, the term in, the, in the sense that historians use it, that means um, any source or material that's relevant to the question. So what, what kind of evidence would we expect to have for someone like Jesus if he was simply a Jewish preacher? I, I have one, Tim, just to cut you off. Yep. We need a DVD with you talking with, a, with Jesus saying, hey, <laughs> it's me. That's what they want. They, I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking about it from what you're saying right now. Like, what is it that you want? This yeah. is the guy, and I think Google and YouTube and social media has broken us so bad. It's like we're using a modern day technology, technological sense and thinking and trying to apply it to 2,000 years ago. What comes yeah. to my brother? Yeah, yeah, this, and, and that's, I think that's a very good point because a lot of people who haven't studied ancient history in any kind of detail expect there to be a lot more evidence for everyone than there actually is. We actually have very little evidence for anyone or anything, and that includes very prominent people. So obviously we don't, we, we have a reasonable amount for emperors or great generals, 
But even there, sometimes we, we don't have very much at all. Some of the lesser emperors or the ones who have very short reigns, we've got very few sources, sometimes just a passing mention, maybe a few coins, and that's it. So, and that's that's a guy who ruled the entire Roman world. Um, the, the example I quite often point to is Hannibal. So Hannibal was the Carthaginian general from um, what's now North Africa, who who challenged the Roman Republic, and uh, came very very close to defeating uh, the Roman Republic completely, and and was was a great threat to the, the Roman world. He, he beat the Romans comprehensively in a number of battles and is considered to be one of the greatest generals in human history, certainly in ancient history. Now, you would expect there to be lots of references to Hannibal from his time. There isn't. There's one. There's a one inscription in Rome of a Roman general, Fabius, who fought against Hannibal. And in his funerary inscription, it mentions that, that he fought against Hannibal. That is the only reference that was made while Hannibal was still alive. Everything we know about Hannibal comes from sources that were written decades or even a couple of centuries later. So the, the earliest source that we have for Hannibal is the writings of Polybius. And that was written um, long after his death and decades after his death. In fact, the gap between Polybius's writings and Hannibal's um, career is about the same as the gap between Jesus's death and the Gospel of Mark, the first, the first and earliest of the Gospels. So, so this is, and that's a guy who was one of the most significant figures in the ancient world. That doesn't mean there weren't, at one stage, lots of references to Hannibal during his lifetime. But the problem is very few sources of any kind about anything or anyone survive because we're talking about 2,000, 2,200 years ago. So when it comes to, to Jesus, people are sort of saying, well, there should be contemporary references to him. When we don't have surviving contemporary references for someone as important as Hannibal, then, then that really undercuts that argument. The other thing to keep in mind is that Jesus was not a great general or a Roman emperor. He was a peasant. So he was a peasant preacher in Galilee, which even the other Jews regarded as a backwater. You know, it was the, it was the sticks. It was, I don't know, Alabama. You know, it was, it was nowheresville. So the idea that the kind of people who were writing history in his lifetime would have been paying any attention to him at all is just ridiculous. And we know that because we have no contemporary references to any of the other early first century Jewish preachers, prophets, messianic claimants, apocalyptic preachers that we know of at the time. We know there were several, but all of those references are to later, from later on. And that's exactly what we find with Jesus, because that's exactly what we would expect. But getting back to the point, um, that's a rule that that, that many you know, mythicist believers make up and say, unless there's contemporary references, he didn't exist. Well, that's a rule that no historian would actually use, because it's, it's, it, would, it would make the whole enterprise of studying ancient history almost impossible. What, what we do is we look at what could we expect to know about a peasant preacher like Jesus, and the answer is pretty much what we've got. Some later references made mainly after he he had died and and talking and, and putting in context the fact that there's a, a sect that centered on him. That's what we would expect. And this, and this is because he he wasn't a guy who walked on water. You know, he wasn't a guy who, who who did miraculous things. Those are stories that were told later. What he was was a guy who went around telling other peasants the kingdom of God is coming. You might be having a crappy life now, but very, very soon God is going to intervene in history and, and everything is going to get better. The rich will be, will be made, made humble. You know, the, the powerful will be brought low. The evil people will be, will be cast into an eternal fire. The world will be renewed and we, the poor, will all live a happy life. Um, there were a lot of people in that period who really liked that idea. You can kind of understand why. And that's who he seems to have been. That's who the earliest Gospels say he was. He doesn't become this sort of exalted, elevated, and, and finally sort of celestial figure until later in, in, the, in the later sources. So the, the progression in the, in the sources that we have is, is actually pretty easy to discern. He does seem to have been originally have been one of these Jewish preachers of whom we know there were plenty around at the time. Yeah. Um, so let's um, do a, a little step-by-step step as far as um, the theology and some, I'm gonna take some questions from the chat in the meantime also. Yeah. Um, at around 
28, 29 of the common era. You have a guy that's preaching that, you know, you know what I wanted to say to you too? It's like the government concerned about me. Why should they be concerned about this guy right here? Yeah. Right about me. Why should I be in the annals of history of the U.S. government? There's no yeah. reason. I could be yeah. preaching the same way Jesus is preaching, but they don't care about me. Why should they be in the records? You know, yeah. but that's just something people don't think about in that you have a whole area and he's not the only person that, you know, is preaching. You got John the Baptist, you got Jesus, you got um, Jesus Ananias later on, you got yep. people in the time, you got the Taheb, you got this guy, that guy. Yep. I mean, come on. Yeah. And, and and the Romans and Greeks, who were the guys who were actually writing history in this period, didn't care about any of that stuff. Didn't didn't mention any of those guys except maybe in passing much, much later on, which is sort of what I, what I was sort of referring to before. Um, so I, I think you know, if, if we talk about what evidence we would expect to have, I think another thing we need to keep in mind is that even the Gospels, which are clearly heavily biased right so we have to we, we we can examine them on the question as to how the stories uh, in them arose so people some people say well, you can't use the gospel well that's stupid obviously we want to try and work out how the stories that are in the gospels arose we have to examine the gospels to work that out we just don't take them at face value but but when, even in the gospels they they try and make him out to be this really significant figure um, but even then, they, they're, they're kind of saying he was really, really famous. He was renowned throughout the whole of Galilee, right? Galilee was, was this tiny little backwater area that you could walk across in a couple of days. And it was, it was you know, of, of no significance whatsoever. So he was really famous in Galilee doesn't really mean much. Then they try and exaggerate it even more and say he was famous through the whole of Syria, which is pretty unlikely. But, but it, what they're not saying is, you know, he was being talked about on the streets of Rome. Or, or, you know, he would have been common knowledge in the streets of Corinth or Athens. He wouldn't have been. They wouldn't have had a clue. So we can't expect there to be to be people in Rome, Corinth, Athens, or even Alexandria writing about him, even if those writings, you know, d didn't survive. We, we don't think that there would have been people actually talking about this guy. He was insignificant. The second thing is even the Gospels make it pretty clear that whatever career he had, it was pretty short. You know, the, the traditional Christian teaching is that his career lasted for three years, which isn't very long, but that's based purely on the Gospel of John talking about him celebrating three Passovers. And there's all kinds of complicated reasons as to why that probably isn't, um, it doesn't reflect anything historical. If you actually look at the account of his career in the Gospel of Mark, which is the earliest Gospel, uh, you could, if you add up all the all the you know the timestamps, you know all the references to passage of time in in that in that gospel, the whole thing happens or could have happened in the space of about two or three weeks. But there's there's very little uh, actual measures of time. It was probably probably longer than that. But what I'm saying is that the window in which we would expect there to actually be references to him while he was alive is very very small, and it's highly unlikely because he was a nobody from the back of nowhere anyway. What we can expect, though, is once his sect, a, a, um, a, a, his sect arise, rises, then we would start to get references to his sect and then references to where it came from. We'll come back to that because he's saying a man who was a threat to Roman records, to the Roman records empire. I'm not sure what that means. Was he a threat to the empire? Um, well, he was probably considered enough of a threat to the empire to be crucified. <laughs> Crucifixion was a was a a, a, a a method of execution for rebels, big brigands, bandits, and pirates, and escaped slaves. Well, he wasn't a pirate. He wasn't a brigand or a bandit. He was clearly uh, they they clearly saw him as a rebel against the Roman Empire. Should there be records of this? We don't have many Roman records. At all, a lot of people think that there's some like vast archive of Roman records. There isn't. We've got fragments, mainly from Egypt, which uh, which are, happen to survive because of the climate there. We have zero, zero zilch, none, no records from uh, from Roman Judea, none. So to say there should be records of this guy, no, because they don't exist. There might have been. Someone might have written a note saying, you know, Pontius Pilate nailed up these, these guys today and one of them was this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, but it hasn't survived. And we wouldn't expect it to because we don't have 
you know, we've got barely any Roman records for anywhere and none at all from this period for this area. So to say that there should be, no, sorry, we've got no records of any of the other guys that got nailed up as well. Uh, Quintilius Varus, about, around about the time Jesus was born, executed 2,000, like crucified 2,000 people on one day. But the only reason we know that is a passing reference in Josephus. He makes his passing remark, oh, and he, he put down this rebellion and he crucified 2,000 people. Are there records of those 2,000 people being executed? Of course not, because we don't have any. So the, the idea that there should be these references simply doesn't stand up to scrutiny. It doesn't make any sense. But what we, what we would do is, what we would expect is to maybe find some references to him later. And that's what we find. We actually find that the Roman historian Tacitus, Tacitus, uh, mentions him in passing. He's he's talking about the origins of the Christian sect. He's talking about the Great Fire of Rome, and he he says, you know, the, these Christians uh, derive their name from a Christus, and he says he was executed in Judea by Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. So he tells us who, what, when, and where. Tiberius uh, Tacitus is a very careful historian. He's he's a quite a skeptical historian. And he hated Christianity. He called Christianity a mischievous superstition with a hatred for mankind and said it was a disgusting thing. So he wasn't exactly a big fan of the Christians, unlikely to be simply repeating what Christians said. And there's a whole lot of other reasons why he doesn't seem to be getting this information from Christians. Isn't um, Tacitus a part of like a, a group or a committee that dealt with groups that had like beliefs and crazy beliefs and so forth? So maybe that yeah. he had... Yeah, he was he was a he was a Roman aristocrat. Uh, he was a former consul and former governor, and he was a former senator. Uh, you had to be a senator to, to be a consul and governor. And then in his retirement, he he took up writing history. He was also um, would have would have served as a priest in the Roman religion, and he was very much a, a believer in the traditional Roman cults. So for him, uh, he he also thought the Jewish religion was was disgusting and ridiculous. Um, so for him, Christianity would have been a, a he called it a superstition, a superstitio. Um, so he, he was no fan of Christianity, but he seems pretty clear. And this is what I'm saying. He's, a, he's quite a, a skeptical and, and careful historian. He seems pretty clear that, uh, that Jesus was a man who lived in a particular place at a particular time. Now, that doesn't definitely clinch it because he was writing um, almost a century later. But for a guy like Tacitus to simply say this stuff, as a matter of fact, he was this dude, he lived at this time, and this is what happened to him, it, that, that actually, for most other figures in the ancient world, would just be enough for historians, for anyone to just go, yeah, okay, then that guy existed. And that's what most historians do. They accept that Tacitus said that because, uh, because he, he had good reason to believe that Jesus was a, was a guy. The, the other references that we have to Jesus, which are written later, one of them is in Josephus, and I'm not talking about the so-called Testimonium Flavianum, which is the, uh, okay. the reference. Hold, hold, hold that a second. I want to, I want you to hold that trump card because that's going to be in the conversation. Hold on, hold that for one second. Here's a question for you: Why would the Romans go to such an extent, glorify and mythologize a little raggedy ghetto preacher? Okay. Well, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. And so, so what happened was this little raggedy preacher was uh, founded a was was the center of a sect of Jews, and they was they were Jews. They they still believed all the stuff that Jews believed. They also believed that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, had in some sense risen from the dead, and was was going to come back when the kingdom of God, this apocalyptic intervention of God in the world happened and Jesus was going to be part of that and was going to come on the clouds of heaven and and you know divide the, the sheep from the goats and judge everyone living in the dead at the right hand of God. All that stuff you find in the book of Revelation. So they, they believed that stuff. But other than that, they were Jews. What happened was their sect started to attract non-Jews and, and increasingly attracted non-Jews. And then when the Jewish rebellion against the Romans in 66 to 70 AD failed, and a lot of Jews were scattered from uh, from their, their homelands in, in places like Judea and, and, and Galilee, then this sect kind of spread even more amongst non-Jews. And eventually it became a cult uh, with, with Jesus as its kind of saviour God that, that divorced itself more and more from its Jewish roots. And eventually Jesus then became a deity and then became God, God himself. It was only hundreds of years later that that 
sect, that cult, got adopted more and more by Romans and eventually was adopted by the Roman Emperor Constantine and then eventually it became the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. So they didn't glorify and mythologise a little raggedy ghetto preacher. They glorified and, and, and uh, mythologised a guy they considered to be God, but that took centuries. But that's how he went from being a raggedy preacher to eventually being God, but it was a 400-year process. So the, the, the idea that he kind of went from preacher to God straight away, that's not what the evidence indicates. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right. This, yeah. is, a, this is a quick, easy one for you. I don't think you have, you're capable of answering this one, but let's, let's try this one out. Is the uh, Vatican holding back information? The, the Vatican holding back information. Yeah, you know, the secret Vatican archives, which apparently are under the under the under St. Peter's Basilica. It's full of all these these suppressed biblical texts that they don't want you to know about. Um, no. <laughs> Just short. Short answer, no. Uh, but the Vatican has the access to exactly the same material that everyone else has, which is, which is, you know, um, what, what, if, there's no hidden stuff that that is in some vault under the Vatican. That's just fucking bullshit. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just can't take that 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 crap seriously. No, the the Vatican does have what are called the secret Vatican archives, but the word secret there doesn't mean you know it's hidden. It means private because they're actually the archives of, of the popes. They go, it goes back to about the 14th century. There's very few ancient documents in there because most of the earlier stuff was, was lost. Uh, and quite a bit of the stuff that used to be in there got lost when it was hauled off by Napoleon and, he, he, and, and it, it got destroyed before they, they managed to get it back. So, no, the, the, it's, a, it's a secret. It's the private Vatican archives. But any scholar can get a letter of, of recommendation, go in there and have a look at whatever they want. There, there's no hidden, <laughs> hidden vault with secret gospels in it. That's just Dan Brown bullshit. You know, the Da Vinci Code is a novel, guys. All right. Um can you show us during any of the three wars between the Romans and the Jews where the name of Jesus is mentioned? No, but why would it be? Why would it be? We, I, I, don't, I don't understand the question. So the, 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 Roman, the Romans and Jews weren't fighting over Jesus. The Romans, and, the Romans and Jews were fighting over the fact that the Jews didn't want to be ruled by the Romans because mm. they saw that as an affront to their, to their religious beliefs. At that stage... You know, we're talking about two, there's actually two main wars. There's a few few little ones, but the two big Jewish wars are, are the uh, the Jewish revolt of, of 66 AD and then the Bar Kokhba revolt in the in the early second the, century. The Kippur's war, that's what he's talking about. Yeah, um, but that, that, that had nothing to do with Jesus. At that stage, Christianity was still a little, a tiny little Jesus sect that barely anyone was paying any attention to. It didn't become in, in any way prominent until late second century, certainly the third century. But at the, at the time that the Jews and Romans were fighting, Christianity was a, wasn't even a blip on the radar. So of course there aren't any references to Jesus. Why would there be? It had nothing to do with him. Um, let me see. We got a question here. How valid is Jesus' resurrection? Uh, didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could, I could do a whole show on why I say it didn't happen. They they believed that it happened. I, you know, Christians sort of say, well, why would they have died for something that didn't happen? People die for stuff that's total bullshit all the time. You know, but just ask any suicide. What, but that's what made Christianity what it is, though. That's what excited the yeah. outsiders because they had yeah. something that said, you, Tim, could die and come back as Tim. And you're like, oh, I'm a, I'm a good-looking guy. I want to come back as me. Sure. Sounds sexy. Sounds good. So why not join this cult? And it does, it does seem to have been something that was kind of in the air at the time. The, the ideas of, of, of uh, the Romans already had, or Greeks and Romans had ideas of humans who, who die and then get elevated to, to godhood. So that was kind of in the air. The Jews were already um, uh, very, very uh, concentrated on, or many of them, on the idea of a resurrection because of that coming kingdom, apocalyptic kingdom of God, why would God only save the people who are alive when that happened? Well, the idea was, well, he isn't. He's going to raise everyone from the dead and everyone is going to get, either get saved or get condemned. So, so th this idea of resurrection was already around. You mentioned John the Baptist as being another one of these apocalyptic preachers, who, and he, he certainly seems to have been, but his sect didn't die out when he died. 
So his sex seemed to have survived. And there's even references in the Gospels where at uh, one point Herod uh, Antipas hears about Jesus and, and says, this is John the Baptist risen from the dead. Um, so why is he saying that? Another another bit, he, Jesus says to his, his followers in, in the Gospels, and this doesn't mean this happened, but there's a story in the Gospels that says, uh, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And, and they say to him, some say you are Elijah, some say you're a prophet, some say you are John the Baptist. Now, this story is told after John the Baptist has had his head cut off. So why are people going around saying that Jesus was John the Baptist? Because it seems to be that there was an idea that John the Baptist had risen from the dead. And later on in in, uh, in Acts, there's a story about, again, doesn't mean this happened, but there's a story about um, Paul and Barnabas meeting some guys baptising people and they and he, they say to them, "Are you baptizing him in the name of Jesus?" And they said, "No, we're we're baptizing him in the name of John the Baptist." So there were followers of John the Baptist out in Greece, long after John the Baptist's death. So what we've got is two sects that both arose at the same time, had more or less the same message, both of whom had their their leaders executed, both of whom had their leaders then talked about as having risen from the dead, and both of whom then spread out into the world outside of the the Jewish sphere in Galilee and, and Judea. So it, it, it happened a couple of times. One of those sects survived and became Christianity. The, the other didn't, though there's some possible connection between the modern religion of Mandaeanism and the and the, uh, the sect of John the Baptist. So yeah, it, did it happen? No, I, I don't think it happened, but that's another story. All right. Um, what about the idea that Jesus was created by Rome to make the people docile? Uh, I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and this is this is a theory that's been put together, put put out by a couple of guys. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one guy called Carotta, who's an Italian writer who, who thinks that Jesus was based on uh, Julius Caesar. And there's another guy called um, Atwill, who, who thinks that Jesus was invented by the Flavian emperors, as as, as the question says, to keep the, the Jewish people docile. Um, I, I, I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense. It, it, first of all, the evidence that they created uh, Jesus out of nothing um, doesn't hold up. Secondly, by the time Christianity actually became prominent, prominent enough for the Romans to be paying attention to it, they immediately proceeded to start persecuting and, and banning it. Um, so it doesn't. If you'd think if they had invented it, they would be encouraging it, not trying to wipe it out. So that that whole theory is pretty damn dubious, and I don't know a single scholar on the planet that takes it seriously. Hmm. All right, um, all right. Let's start the questions for a little bit. I'm gonna um... just let's let's go back to that question of you know what what you know, what references do we have to Jesus? Because I was going to talk about. Josephus, right, right, right? right. So I'm not I'm not talking about the, the the bit in Josephus that everyone knows about, which is the Testimonium Flavianum. So that's a passage in Book 18 of of Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews. Josephus, as I mentioned, was a uh, was a Jewish aristocrat. Uh, he was a Jewish historian. He fought uh, on the losing side in the Jewish War of 66 to 70. He worked out that he was on the losing side and he switched sides. He went over to the Romans and that's why he, he managed to survive that war. He then um, became an exile uh, because he was now hated by other Jews. So he became an exile in Rome and he worked as a historian in Rome uh, at the court of the Flavian emperors, so the emperors Vespasian and Titus. So in his, his book, um, uh, The Antiquities of the Jews, there is a passage in, in Book 18 that talks about Jesus. The problem is that it's uh, highly debatable as to whether that's actually original to Josephus. The majority of scholars think that it, it is, but it has been added to. So there are bits in there that Josephus definitely didn't say. Um, it says things like, he was the Messiah. Well, Josephus didn't believe that. It says he, he appeared to his followers on the third day after his death. Josephus didn't believe that either. So that stuff at least has been added. Is the whole passage a forgery or is it just a, a passage that has been added to? Most scholars think that it, it, it was, it's partially authentic and has just been added to. So there was a reference to, uh, to Jesus in Book 18. A minority of scholars make a good case, and I think, it, I think it can be argued, that the whole passage is a forgery. Um, I'm personally inclined towards the parcel of authenticity side of that, of that debate, but I don't think there's any way we can determine one way or the other. It's a moot question. So I leave 
the, the book 18 reference, the testimonium to one side completely. But there's a second reference to Jesus in uh, Antiquities of the Jews in book 20, so book 2200, um, Josephus mentions Jesus again. This one is accepted by virtually all Josephus scholars as being authentic. There's a couple that don't. Uh, there's a couple of other scholars who, not surprisingly, include Richard Carrier, who don't. But most scholars, almost all, accept that it is authentic. So this second reference is actually a passing reference. What Josephus is talking about is a major upheaval a major political event around 62, 63 AD, where the high priest, uh, Hanan ben Hanan, was deposed by the Romans. So what happened was Hanan ordered the execution of some people when the uh, the Roman governor, the Roman prefect, uh, uh, procurator, wasn't actually there. The former procurator had died. The new one was still on his way out from Rome. Hanan ordered these executions. He was meant to get Roman permission to execute anyone. And so some of Hanan's political enemies objected. And when the new procurator turned up, he actually had Hanan deposed. This was a big deal. Um, the high priest was the, effectively the ruler of Judea. The Romans kind of you know, kept, kept him under their control, but he, he did the day-to-day -day administration of the, of the area. So this was a big, big deal. But the, uh, the, the issue is here is that when, when talking about this, this event, Josephus says that one of the executions included um, that a, a guy called James, who was brother of that Jesus who was called Messiah. Now, you've got the question up there saying, did it originally include the reference to Jesus who was the Christ? No, because it doesn't say that. It says legomenu, which means called. He was called Messiah. He's not saying that he was the Messiah. He's saying that people called him the Messiah because people did. So he's identifying Jesus uh, from various other people called Yeshua, various other people called Jesus, because that was a very common name, by identifying him as the one that was called Messiah. This is important because James lived in the same city as Josephus. He was an older contemporary of Josephus. They lived, both lived in Jerusalem. Um, when he was executed, Josephus was about 25 or 26 years old. He was also a member of the priestly caste, and had just come back from Rome where he'd been on an embassy to the Roman Senate on behalf of the high priest. And he got back to Rome to find the high priest either was about to be deposed or had been deposed, depending on when he got back. And so he was very, very close to these events. So if he says that these events were triggered by the execution of this guy who was the brother of Jesus who was called the Messiah, that's extremely good evidence that James was a historical guy who lived in the same city as Josephus. And, and he identifies James by reference to his more famous brother. It's hard to have a brother if, if you don't exist. So Josephus seems to be pretty clear that both James, who, who was he, he lived in the same city as, and his brother existed. Okay? So that, that's a very difficult one for mythicists to get around. One of the ways a Carrier does this, he, he tries to get around it by arguing that the reference to uh, who was called the Messiah was added later. And so this is a reference to a, another James and another Jesus. In fact, it's a Jesus who's mentioned later in the passage, Jesus, son of Damnaeus. I've got a very long article about why that doesn't work on my blog called uh, James, the brother of the Lord. Um, no other scholar finds Carrier's arguments convincing. Um, I, I, I suppose I could, I could go into detail why, but no other scholar finds his, his arguments. No one cites it. No one, no one has actually found it in any way convincing. It's, a, it's like many of his arguments. It really doesn't work. It's quite contrived. So this is most likely a reference by, you know, by a good historian uh, who, who was talking about something that happened when he was a young man, and he refers to Jesus as a historical person. In interestingly, we have another reference to James, by someone who met James, and that's Paul. So Paul, when he was writing a letter to the community in Galatians, in, in Galatia, the Galatians, he, he was making an argument saying, um, those guys who have been talking to you and saying, I'm not a real apostle because I'm subordinate to those guys in Jerusalem, that's not true. So he's arguing, I didn't go down to Jerusalem after I, I, I saw my vision of Jesus and get my teaching from those guys. I didn't meet any of those guys. And then he says, oh, um, except Cephas, that's Peter, and James, the brother of the Lord. 
So when he says this, he's actually undercutting the argument that he's making. He's trying to argue, I didn't meet any of those guys, but he has to admit that he did meet two of them. He met James and he met Peter, and he identifies James as the brother of the Lord. Again, it's very difficult to meet the brother of a guy who never existed. Paul seems pretty clear that he met Jesus as a brother. Mythicists try to get around this by saying, well, brother was often used by Paul in a figurative sense. He, he doesn't mean brother. He actually means kind of a follower of Jesus. Um, the problem with that is, is even you know, people like Carrier, Earl Doherty and, and Robert Price have to admit that he doesn't just use the word brother. He uses a very specific term, brother of the Lord. He only uses this in two places in this passage and in a passage in 1 Corinthians. And in both places, he mentions these brothers of the Lord or this brother of the Lord alongside other followers like Peter or other apostles. So these brothers of the Lord have to be a subgroup of, Christian, of Christian believers. So what subgroup is this? Well, the most obvious answer, given that we have various other references to Jesus having brothers, to them being his followers after his death, to them including James, to James being a leader of the of the church in the period that Paul was talking, is that brothers of the Lord means brothers of the Lord. The, the idea that this is some kind of figurative uh, meaning has to require there to be some other group who weren't Jesus' siblings who were called brothers of the Lord, and there's no evidence for that. So that's based purely on a hypothesis, on a supposition, which is why that argument against this being a reference to Jesus' brother doesn't work. So we've got two references to Jesus' brother who lived much, much longer than Jesus. He lived into his, what appears to be into his 60s or even later. So it makes sense that we've got references to his brother it, it, where we don't have references you know, from his time to him. But everyone seemed to be pretty clear that James was brother of this guy who was called Messiah. Now, is any of this is any of this a slam dunk? No. But when you pile it up, there's there's multiple vectors of evidence which all seem to be pointing in one direction that there was a dude. And and the problem with with mythicism is that any form of mythicism has to require that there was an alternative to how these stories about Jesus arose. If there wasn't a guy then there has to be some other explanation. So they come up with versions of, well, there was an earlier form of Christianity or kind of a proto-Christianity that believed in a celestial Jesus who never came to earth or that believed in an allegorical Jesus who was just kind of a metaphor or who believed in a, a kind of a, a, a deity Jesus who was an amalgam of you know, ancient Egyptian gods. The problem is there's no evidence for any of these supposed hypothetical earlier forms of Christianity. And that's a huge problem for mythicism, because there should be. You know, if you, you want, we've got multiple books by early Christians condemning various alternative forms of Christianity. They call them heresies. We just call them other, other forms of Christianity. But they, they went to a lot of effort to condemn these other forms of Christianity that said Jesus was just a spirit rather than a human being, or that Jesus was purely human being and not, a, not a, a deity at all. But none of them make any references to an early form of Christianity that believed that Jesus didn't exist on earth in some way. And if that was the original form of Christianity, then it's bizarre that we have no references to it. Hmm. The most likely explanation for why we have no references to it is because it didn't exist. It, it, it's been invented as a way to try and get around the problem of, well, how do these stories arise if there was no actual dude? And, and this is another reason why most scholars just don't find mythicism convincing. It's based on a, on a pile of suppositions. And Occam's razor is a key tool for historians. Occam's razor makes short work of any hypothesis that depends on a whole, whole stack of suppositions. This is why uh, most, most historians just don't find it, uh, don't find it at all convincing. Um, question from Courtney Thompson. Tim's view on the spoken languages of Galilee in the first century. How Greek was Judea from his view? Could Jesus have spoken Greek and been influenced by the surrounding Greek culture of Galilee? Yeah, um, good question. Galilee was referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles by other Jews. They considered it to be uh, not quite Jewish enough. They, they thought it was a little bit tainted by particularly by Greek culture. So I think what we, we have to remember is that this whole area had been conquered by the Greeks 
under Alexander the Great and had then be, remained part of uh, Greek speaking uh, and Greek ruled kingdoms um, ruled by the, the successors of the generals of Alexander the Great. So the, the area in which Judea and, and, uh, and Galilee uh, existed was part of Syria and Syria was, was ruled for many, many years by the Seleucid kings who were descendants of, uh, of one of Alexander's generals. So there were Greek cities, Greek speaking population, Greek uh, style temples. And then of course, they got conquered by the Romans or got axed by the Roman empire. And so of course you had uh, Roman, Latin speaking Roman officials, but the main language, kind of the lingua franca, the language that was used for common communication in the Eastern half of the Roman empire was Koine Greek, was, was the, 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 uh, the, the standard language of, of the Greek speaking people. So would Jesus have known Greek? He probably knew a bit. I mean, because he, he was interacting with people uh, in, in that area who, who did speak Greek. And as he, so he would have been probably not bilingual, but he probably would have known a few phrases here and there. Uh, but on, on the whole, the people who would have been fluent in Greek were the ones who lived in the main cities. So the biggest city near, uh, near, near him, the biggest city in, in, in Galilee was Sephorus. And that was would definitely have been a Greek speaking area. But it, it, did Jesus speak Greek? Uh, maybe. I mean, he was a peasant. So it's most likely his first language would have been Aramaic, and he, and he probably would have had, had some a good understanding of Hebrew, which was which was the the ancestor of Aramaic. Uh, was he Greek speaking? Don't know. Was he influenced by Greek ideas? It would have been difficult for him not to be, and that was because Judaism, so the, his own religion, had been permeated by Greek ideas for centuries, and so a lot of the ideas that uh, were were very much part of of what we call Second Temple. Judaism, so the, the various varieties of Judaism that was around at the time, had actually been heavily influenced by some Greek ideas. So the idea of, uh, of kind of sub-gods below God um, was, was very much kind of a Greek idea, and that, that had, had permeated Judaism and seems to have been accepted in Christianity, certainly by Paul. Um, the idea of, of daemones or demons and, and angels um, was partly Persian, but also partly from ancient Greece. And we, we see a lot of influence in, of, of Greek ideas in the Jewish writer Philo of Alexandria. He, he talked about the Logos, for example, which was a, a Neoplatonic or Platonic idea. And we find that in the Gospels as well. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God and the Word was with God, or the Word was a God and the Word was with God. Logos is, 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 the, is the Word. So we, we actually find this in Christianity. How much would Jesus have been have, have been uh, um, familiar with this stuff? Probably not directly, but indirectly, it would have influenced some of his ideas because he was a Jew of his time. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, who was Linus, also known as Bar? I guess Simon Bar Jesus was he? No, I, no idea. <laughs> no, no, sorry, no idea. Uh, um, any other questions? Let me know. All right. Um, let me ask you about this. At 29, um, because I found it. All right. All right. We don't need that right now. All right. We good. All right. So we have a book called the New Testament. Yeah. In 29 CE, Jesus is alive. Nobody knows about a New Testament. There's no writings. The followers are not writing. Yeah. Um, how does this reflect on? later on Christianity, where it's a, now a book religion. I, I, people don't understand that before 70 AD, the temple falling, Judaism pretty much was a temple religion where people were concerned about the temple and their relationship with the people and the priesthood. But after that time period, everybody scattered doing their thing or whatever. Um, the apocalyptic nature of the first century, people waiting for a Messiah or somebody. Um, how do you look at the, the writings of Christianity later on into a 27 books compared to the early followers of Jesus? Would you yeah. think of it as the same Christianity or a different version of it? Well, I think probably the first thing to keep in mind is that we don't have a book called the New Testament. We have a collection of texts called that we call the New Testament, which is part of a bigger collection of texts that we call the Bible. But but when people think of the Bible and think of it as a book, they're getting it wrong. It's not a book. It's a library. Um, we just happen to bind it together in one volume because that's convenient. Uh, but these texts were all written at different times 
by different people and they're in different genres and none of them were written by someone who thought that they were eventually going to be gathered together and considered to be the the holy word of god um some of them like paul's letters were just letters i mean these were these were he was writing letters and if you said to paul oh that letter you wrote to those guys in galatia is going to be considered to be the divinely inspired word of god he probably would have found that bizarre and possibly blasphemous or even just laughable and if you look at some of the stuff he says in those letters it's like you know can you get this guy to send me the cloak that i left at his house the other day these are letters so what is the new testament it's a collection of of texts that through a process of of elimination some scrutiny and and some pure luck came to be regarded as reflecting the true christianity but there was a lot of wrangling over which of those texts were the the, the proper ones there wasn't a lot of debate about the, the four gospels the four gospels were recognized as being the earliest and the most authority pretty early on there were plenty of other gospels written but none of them were really considered to be uh, to be to, to be the the authoritative ones and and scholars agree that those four gospels are almost certainly the earliest there might be a couple of other gospels that are a little bit close but those four gospels are definitely the earliest the the other books in that the other texts that find their way into the new testament were written at various times over the next really over the next 200 years so what we find is that if you look at the 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 text of the new testament in what is their likely chronological order you see a development and i mentioned this before if you look at the earliest uh, references to Jesus there in the letters of Paul. They were written in about the 50s, probably the 50s AD, so about 20 years after Jesus' death. He's not writing an account of Jesus' life. So a lot of people say, well, why doesn't he talk about the miracles? Why doesn't he talk about Jesus' mother? Why doesn't he talk about you know this, this, these episodes from the Gospels? Because he was writing theology. So he was writing, he was writing letters about theology. He mentioned stuff in passing. He talks about Jesus being born of a woman. He talks about Jesus being a descendant of King David. So he's definitely talking about a human being, but he wasn't writing an account of Jesus' life. But what we do find is him talking about Jesus as, um, as the Messiah, not God, but as the Jewish Messiah who had uh, been exalted by his resurrection and had gone on to heaven and was coming back very soon when the apocalypse came. What we then find is that the next, the next book in, in order is, uh, most likely is is the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Mark tells a, a very simple story. It's a very you can read the Gospel of Mark in, in an hour or two, and it tells a very simple story about Jesus coming out as a preacher, preaching that the kingdom of God is near at hand. The apocalypse is coming very very soon. Um, he, he, all of his miracles, all of his parables in that gospel are all about this coming apocalypse. He then gets crucified and then there's um, a, a reference to his tomb being empty and and but we don't actually see him rising from the dead that got tacked onto the gospel of mark later on if you take all the miracles and crap out of, out of the gospel of mark what you get is a very straightforward story about a jewish preacher preaching the coming apocalypse so if we're going to say anything is probably uh, as close as we're going to get to the story of what jesus was and did it's that yeah, take the take the miracles out of the Gospel of Mark, and you pretty much got it. Gospel of of Matthew is an expansion of Mark. Gospel of Luke probably came much much later. Gospel of John is something else again. Jesus is no longer talking about the coming of the kingdom; he's talking about his coming. So he's now presenting himself as the the event. It's not something in the future because because the kingdom hadn't come, <laughs> so the apocalypse hadn't come. So it, it evolved to be to be about him as a saviour, and then the later books, you know, the, the later letters attributed to Paul and and John and and uh, Peter, uh, are, are developments of that idea. And so we see him turning into a god. So we see a progression. Uh, the, the the problem, of course, is that Christianity doesn't see it as a progression. They see it as all the one thing. So they're constantly trying to read later stuff into the earlier texts. So they're constantly, I, I have Christians saying to me, Jesus is proclaimed as God in the Gospels. I say, okay, show me where in the Gospel of Mark it, it says anywhere that Jesus is God. And they can't do it because it's not there. They read it in, but it's not there. What's, what's my analysis of Tom Holland's new book, Dominion? Uh, Tom, Tom's a friend of mine um, and, uh, and a, a great guy. I don't agree with Tom on everything. 
Um, he's a bit of a provocateur, but his book Dominion is, um, it's an interesting book. He basically says that effectively that a lot of what we regard as being normal uh, is actually um, deep in, in, in our culture because of, because of Christianity. Christianity is actually the, uh, is actually the, 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 the primary basis of most things that we regard to be moral and so on. It's a pretty provocative thesis, but he makes it well. Um, I won't go into detail because I've got a lengthy review of Dominion on my, uh, on my, on my website. So go to my website, historyforatheists.com, and you, you can you can read up on it. Um, I'm going to be launching a video channel, a YouTube channel myself, sometime reasonably soon, and I'm probably going to get Tom on as an interviewee. So I'll be able to answer that question for you in detail. Jesus Christ is Serapis Christos, which is Apius the golden calf. Um, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that, that, that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, I, know, I know where that guy is coming from and I know what he's basing that on, but it's such a silly concept, a silly assertion that I'm not even bothered, going to bother to unpack it. Uh, no, Jesus had nothing to do with Serapis and had, and Serapis had nothing to do with the golden calves. Wow, where do people get this shit from? <laughs> Seriously. Sorry, but that's just silly. Craziness. Um, let me ask you this. Um, second century, yep. um, the Jewish population, what, what, um, they, they, they move from Jesus the, in the Kiddos war, they claim in Lucas is the Messiah in 135 AD Barkova, they came in Simon Barkova is the Messiah. At that point, where is Jesus in the mix at 135 AD? Because of course, the, the, the temple folks, they, I mean, the, the folks that remained in, in Judea, they don't, they're not feeling. And by the way, when we say Judea, by the way, Judea was expanded geographically wise. So, so parts of Israel was considered Judea because yeah. of the Roman, you know, they brought yeah. whole Trump borderline stuff going on. Yeah, right? yeah. There, there's a, there, there was a, a part of the province of Syria which was officially called Judea, but Judea was also used as a slightly more generic term for the regions in, in Syria where, where Jews were, were the dominant um, part of the population. That include Galilee, Samaria, and uh, the Transjordan and a few other areas. Um, where was where was Jesus around the time of, say, the, the, the end of the, the Bar Kokhba rebellion? Um, again, just a blip on the radar. Uh, there, were, there were lots of sects within Judaism at this time. At that stage, Christianity, or what we call Christianity, the Jesus sect, was splintering into a whole lot of, of subsects. And so this is where you get this vast sort of variety of forms of Christianity. There was no, you know, this Christian idea that there was the church. There wasn't the church. There was churches. They had communication with each other, but they just agreed on a heap of stuff. So Bart Ehrman has a great book called Lost Christianities, where he traces this period where Christianity was starting to expand, was still very small, but it was very fragmented. And and what what turned into the church was basically the, the the version of Christianity that kind of became dominant, and then effectively wiped out uh, or or um, out argued the other forms. So what where was Christianity at this stage? Growing small, still small, but growing and highly fragmented, with lots of very very different ideas about who and what Jesus was. All right. Um, the development of the New Testament, who do you think, as far as church fathers, were responsible for making or made the most impression as far as putting these 22, 27 books together and forming a canon? Which mm -hmm. church fathers do you think played the most important role? It, it, it seems to have been a reasonably organic process. So it wasn't like there was one guy who stood up and said, this is it. Um, we do get, so Athanasius in the, uh, in the, the fourth century, does sort of say here's the list, right? But what he's doing is he's he's not he's not saying this is it because I say so. He's saying this is what we've kind of everyone's kind of agreed to over the last sort of two or three hundred years. The the idea that uh, they were selecting some books as being the proper ones um, th th that that is actually was actually a very common thing in the ancient Greek world. So the the ancient Greek philosophers and their followers had the same problem. As Christianity, where there were a whole lot of works kicking around saying, well, this is written by Plato, 
or this is written by Democritus, or this is written by, um, by, by Aristotle, and some of them were, and some of them weren't. Some of them were written by what we call pseudepigraphers, so they were pseudepigraphical. They were written, written in the name of the great man, um, but they were really they were really actually written by someone else. So they're kind of forgeries. Christianity was effectively in that tradition where it was using the same kind of rules to to try and work out what is authentic and what isn't. Some of those rules were actually pretty smart. They were looking at um, the language and saying, well, that isn't something that someone would have would have said. Others were were more sort of, well, he's saying stuff that I don't agree with, so therefore this book can't be right. But the the whole idea of a canon of uh, the Bible actually comes from the Greek word kanon, which means a ruler, you know, running a ruler over over the, the text and trying to work out if it's correct. This is something that Greek scholars have been doing for a long time. It's something that the Christian scholars inherited. Um, we, as I said before, when it comes to the four Gospels, we think they got it more or less right. When it comes to the epistles and so on, they got bits of it right and bits of it wrong. So there are seven epistles attributed to Paul that pretty much all scholars agree actually are by Paul. But there's a whole lot of others that, that almost certainly aren't, and then there's some that are kind of in between, but you know, mo most critical scholars don't think were actually by Paul. So how did it come about? It, it, there was no sort of... The, the idea that there was some council where you know, it's usually the Council of Nicaea is cited as that's where the Emperor Constantine decided what was in the Bible. Total bullshit. Uh, the Bible was never discussed at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, in fact, no major ecumenical council discussed the, the canon of the Bible until the Council of Trent in the, uh, in the seven, 16th century. So 17th century. So it, uh, it, it's, uh, that, that idea just isn't, isn't correct. It kind of came about by consensus and it took a while for everyone to kind of get more or less the, the, the same idea as to what was and wasn't in the Bible. Keep in mind that Catholic Bibles and Protestant Bibles differ to this day. There's still some texts in the Catholic Bibles that you won't find in Protestant ones. So the process continued for centuries. All right. Um, would you, um, what do you think about um, folks like Ignatius and, and Polycarp and Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian. Do you see those guys as major role players in the development of the doctrine that we have called Christianity today? Yeah, yeah. We we actually see that process of uh, of a, a, what was originally a Jewish sect turning into a non-Jewish religion through the the writings of those guys, where they were arguing amongst themselves, but certainly arguing with, with other forms or interpretations of Christianity. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's really where we can, we can trace it. Again, Christians, uh, look, particularly Catholics, uh, look at those guys and say, oh, yeah, they're all, they're all on the same page and they're all saying the same stuff. You actually read their writings, they're not. <laughs> and, and a couple of them, you know, Origen, for example, is regarded as a heretic because even though he said a lot of stuff that – uh, is, it became part of Christian doctrine. He also had some ideas about uh, about Jesus and, and his relationship to the Trinity, which is which didn't quite make it through the uh, uh, through the, the the process of elimination. And so he's um, still respected, but not regarded as being as being uh, uh, entirely orthodox. Um, sorry, back to you guys' question about uh, Elamas or Limas. I didn't quite understand the spelling, but yeah, that's a guy mentioned in Acts. Uh, apparently, it was meant to be a, a sorcerer. Uh, tried to try to you know, apparently convert a proconsul. Not quite sure where the where the question's coming from, though. Not not sure why he's significant. He's a very minor figure mentioned in passing in Acts. There's not a lot in Acts. It's entirely historical anyway, so can't see how he's important. Oh, okay. All right. Um, let me see if there's any questions in the audience for you. Anybody have any questions? Please post your questions. I'm going to be on for probably another 15 minutes. Um, with, I'm going to start calling you Pastor Tim. <laughs> don't. Please don't. There's enough, there's enough rumors about me being, uh, being a Christian as it is. <laughs> what about the medieval era? I'm going to get back to Christian in a second. What you, I know you're an expert in the medieval era. For which, which culture, though, are you an you, uh, expert on? Uh, well, I'd, I'd hesitate to say expert, but yeah, I've, I've certainly read more fucking books on that than most human beings. 
you can see you can see them in in the shelves behind me um uh, look I, i've got i mean it's a medieval period it's a long period it's, it's a period of thousand one thousand years mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm i suppose i've studied certain aspects of the medieval period more than most um i, I generally focus on western europe um which is which is really what what the, the term medieval you know between in between medium avum between the roman empire and uh, and the modern world um refers to uh, but in passing, I suppose I've, I've picked up quite a bit about medieval Islam, particularly medieval uh, Islamic scholarship, and uh, and then and also the Eastern Roman Empire, so the Byzantine Empire, so the bit of the Roman Empire that didn't collapse, and uh, and that that dominated the Eastern Mediterranean for most of the medieval period. Uh, they were Christians as well, but they were Orthodox Christians, whereas the Christians in medieval Europe were Catholics, and uh, they they kind of agreed, but also like to disagree and occasionally fought a few wars. Um, so yeah, I, I'm particularly interested in the fall of the Roman, Western Roman Empire. And I spent many, many years studying the uh, the Germanic uh, people. So the, the Ostrogoths, um, Visigoths, Franks, uh, and various other Germanic tribes that invaded and and, uh, and carved out kingdoms in the wake of the Roman Empire. Um, but I'm also very interested in the later Roman, uh, later medieval period, particularly the 14th century. That's kind of a a period that I've studied a lot because there's a lot of cool stuff in the 14th century, the Black Death, Hundred Years' War, um, inventions of, of various kinds, scientific advancements, despite what people tell you. It's an interesting period. How impactful were the Gnostics on the development of religious ideas? Um, the, the idea that there was a kind of, there was a branch of Christianity called the Gnostics is a, is a modern idea. Um, it's, it's, that's a term that gets used about, I suppose, about some forms of Christianity that were a little more mystical than the, uh, than the, the, the orthodox form that, that became the dominant form of Christianity. Um, the, the, these forms of Christianity were very heavily connected to, um, to, to Greek philosophy, particularly Neoplatonic philosophy, and saw Jesus as, uh, as a kind of a, a uh, largely spiritual emissary from a spiritual world. And the idea was we were, he was here to help us escape from the physical world and rejoin the, the real uh, world, which was, which was the world of, of spirit and pure form. Um, some of those ideas permeated Christianity. Some of those ideas were already in Christianity because that kind of thinking, as I mentioned, had already permeated uh, pre-Christian Jewish uh, theology. How did how did they those ideas influence the development of later religious ideas? Uh, it, it, it tends to be overstated. A lot of people get very excited about the Gnostics because we've got Gnostic so-called Gnostic gospels. We've got gospels which were written by this these forms of Christianity, which are very very different, and uh, they're, they're quite interesting. Some of them are really weird. And a lot of people get very excited about those and go, these are the real Gospels, this is the real story of Jesus. Well, yeah. probably not. Most most of them were written in the second, third century, some of them even later. And uh, they, they, they're uh, more reflections of, of that period I was talking about before where Christianity was fragmenting and was was you know growing in various wild and strange versions. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to study these texts for that reason. Uh, but um, I wouldn't say that the Gnostics were a great influence on religious ideas hey, i've just yeah. seen just seen this question is king james black no, 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 don't say it yet don't. <laughs> put this up there to mess with you mr. okay oh mr medieval expert i want to mess with you right now i'm saying <laughs> blue what do you say um what the hell is this king james is it, are we talking about king james of scotland and england <laughs> He was a Scottish guy. How many black Scottish people have you fucking seen? That is the <laughs> dumbest shit I've ever seen. Where, where is this coming from? I, I, oh, man, I never get, I never cease to be amazed at some of the incredible stuff people come up with. Is that a joke? The next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, he was a fucking Scot. He looked like oh, me, man. you know? Funny, pale and red-headed and red-faced. Oh, <laughs> you know what? 
I'm actually gonna. In, I'm trying to invite Tom Ritchie. I don't know if you know who Tom Ritchie is. You know who Tom Ritchie is? Yeah, he's a pretty good um, researcher and about King James and European history, and he, you know, okay. he's, you know, he's pretty good. So I was actually gonna invite him on to talk about the entire Anglo-Saxon history and King James because there's a faction in our community that believes that King James is black. So. As amusing wow. as it is, <laughs> okay. remember when you emailed me the first okay. time? You said, I hope you're not one of them nuts that talk about the whole Europe of black. And <laughs> oh, you were laughing about it, right? Well, uh, look, I shouldn't be mean, but okay. come on, guys, he was Scottish. I mean, <laughs> all right, if you get Tom Ritchie on, I'll be happy to watch that. So, I'd, I'd love to know what the I'm hell that to get is all about. Why King James? Because British Israelism teaches. Oh, that. They uh, so they, uh, Judah and all that. Oh, wow. Okay. Go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I won't, I won't say any more other than no, he wasn't black. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of Jews accepted Jesus as Messiah? Why did more non Jews accept? Yeah. Um, look, initially it was a very, very small percentage. As I said, um, even the Gospels can't pretend that Jesus' following was huge. They, they, they try to say that thousands of people listen to him preach and so on. But when you look kind of, when you look around the stories, when you look, look at what they say, it's pretty clear that that's, that's probably not true and that he, he, uh, he, he probably had a fairly small following. Look, look for example, at the accounts, which are uh, highly unreliable, but the accounts of his arrest and trial and, and crucifixion. Even in those stories where they're trying to put the best possible spin on, on Jesus as, as they can, these crowds that supposedly appeared and welcomed him into Jerusalem suddenly disappear. You know, when, when he gets arrested, where are all those guys, right? They're, they're, they're nowhere to be found. And then the, he's telling next, the gospel to tell a story about Pontius Pilate saying, do you want me to crucify this guy or do you want me to let him go? And they're all, there's this, suddenly there's a huge crowd saying, kill him. So where are all these, these supposed followers? Um, the, the other thing is that, you know, if we look at some of the other, uh, Jewish preachers and prophets that were around at the time that I mentioned before. In in Josephus, he talks about some of these guys. He talks about the Romans having to mobilize large units of troops to break up the following that these guys had. They had thousands and thousands of followers, and the Romans literally had to mobilize squadrons of cavalry and infantry to break up these troops, uh, break up these, these crowds. Nothing like that, even in the Gospels. You know, there's like a tiny handful of probably temple guards. So what percentage of him accepted him as the Messiah? Probably no more than a few hundred, maybe. You know, so what percentage of Jews overall? Well, a tiny you know, fraction of 1%. The reason we're talking about this guy now is because of a series of accidents of history that meant that of all the sects of various Messiahs that were around at the time, this one survived. So it's a bit like evolution, you know, why, why, why is this creature um, still around whereas this creature isn't? Well, luck. Uh, so that's a very, very few accept him as Messiah. Why did more non-Jews accept him? Well, eventually they did. But as I said, that took hundreds of years. And, and it, it actually took Christianity to, to evolve from a, a, a Jewish sect, which wouldn't have been accepted by, by many non-Jews at all, to something that was entirely non-Jewish into something that was actually quite Roman before it got accepted by uh, by, by a large number of people in, in the Roman Empire and beyond. Was Paul attempting to replace Jesus? No. <laughs> no. Um, I've just finished reading actually a very good book um, by Paula Fredrickson, who's one of the best scholars of uh, of um, critical scholars of New Testament uh, today. She's not a Christian. But she just written, has written a, recently a book on Paul as apostles of the Gentiles. It's quite clear that Paul thought Jesus was the Messiah, um, and Paul uh, sincerely believed that the apocalypse was coming um, in his lifetime, very, very soon, and that that involved Jesus uh, coming as in, in, the, in the parousia, uh, in his, his sort of kingly coming at the, at the end of the world. So he wasn't trying to create his own sect. He, he saw... Jesus as the fulfillment of, of the Jewish religion. Both he and Jesus were devout Jews. So he didn't see himself as uh, as creating a sect. He saw himself very much as 
as as uh, the, the 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 believing in the proper form of Judaism. The, he he didn't see it. Christianity wasn't a separate religion at that stage, and didn't become one probably for another at least another century, maybe a bit less, but at least another half century. Before you um, respond to that question, um, I noticed something with the mythicists. They all believe in Paul, except, I mean, Robert Christ believes in a Paul, but he doesn't believe in Simon. Yeah. But they all believe in a Paul. How yeah. is it that they believe in a Paul, but don't believe in a Jesus who has much more evidence, in my opinion, than Paul? <laughs> well, well, it, is so it, it, it probably, uh, I, I, I can answer that by. You know what's weird about Paul? Yeah. Everybody in the ancient Near East had a shipwreck story. You know, <laughs> you notice that? A, a he had to have one too. I have yeah. one. You know, <laughs> um, shipwrecks were actually reasonably not, not common, but but they did happen. I mean, it was it was the main way of getting around. Uh, you know, the, the the Mediterranean was very much a highway. And, um, and but it was also a reasonably dangerous way of, of getting around. So it's not unlikely that Paul might have suffered a shipwreck. Most of the stories we got about Paul are from Acts, and we can't take them as uh, history. Um, Acts is, is is a set of folk tales. Some of them might might be based on something historical, but it's really impossible to to tell which ones are, are true. Um, but why do we accept that it's most likely there was a guy called Paul? Well. It's a bit like these guys who try to prove that Shakespeare didn't write the plays of Shakespeare. And uh, there's there's a whole group of guys, you know, there's a whole group of people who are very much like mythicists, actually. They get quite passionate about the idea that Shakespeare didn't write the plays of Shakespeare. It was written by um, the, you know, the, the various earls or uh, various other, other, other playwrights. It wasn't Shakespeare. But there's a story that there was a guy who sp spent his entire life trying to prove that uh, that um, Shakespeare didn't write the plays of Shakespeare, and he came to the conclusion that the the plays of Shakespeare were not written by Shakespeare, but were written probably by someone very very much like Shakespeare, who had the same name as Shakespeare. Think about that for a second. Uh, Paul is a little bit like that. We've got, as I mentioned, a whole lot of letters which we have in the in the in the New Testament which are attributed to Paul. Seven of them seem to all be by the same guy, okay? The others seem to be quite different, but seven of them, from analysis of the, of the language, from analysis of the vocabulary, from analysis of the contents, from analysis of the theology that these letters present, and, and the fact that there's consistency across those seven, most, almost all scholars accept that those were written by the same guy. And then we find there are these other letters which were attributed to Paul. Remember I was saying before that the ancient Greek schools of philosophy had this problem of people coming along and writing books that they attributed or that were attributed to Plato or to Aristotle, but which weren't. Now, the only reason you do that is if there was a Plato or there was an Aristotle that lends those later pseudepigraphical forgeries authority. It doesn't make sense to forge something if there wasn't an attributed to a famous guy, if there wasn't a famous guy in the first place. So, so if we've got people attributing letters to Paul, it makes most sense that there was a guy called Paul. Otherwise, why, why would you do that? And, and when then we've got this, these seven letters, which are all attributed to Paul, which all seem to have the same, the right content for them to be written by Paul, and which all seem to be written by the same guy. So the most logical conclusion is that there was a guy called Paul who wrote those letters and then other people wrote other letters attributed to him. Does that definitely mean Paul existed? Uh, no, but like everything else in the in this this stuff, it's a matter of probability. Paul never existed and was all written by Flavius by Josephus. No, sorry, Malik, that's bullshit as well. I'm not sure where you're getting this stuff from, mate. Hey, the folks who are asking questions, don't cuss Tim out in the chat. You ask the question. Now, if you don't like the answer, hey, it is. It is what it is. Move on. You know? yeah, look, okay. Well, sorry. Just to try and take that question seriously. Um, there's nothing in the letters of Paul that would indicate that it was written by Flavius Josephus. Flavius Josephus wasn't a Christian. Whoever wrote the letters of Paul was clearly a Christian. 
the, the stuff that, that the letters of Paul referred to all date to the 50s AD. No works that we have of Flavius Josephus date to earlier than the 90s AD. I, I, I cannot understand why anyone <laughs> would say that they were written by Flavius Josephus. I, yeah, anyway, look, there's a lot of interesting ideas out there for that one. Ooh. What, what role do Greek and Roman myths play? Um, Christians will say none. Uh, I will say that it gets the, the idea that, that uh, Christian beliefs were heavily influenced by, um, by, by what we call pagan beliefs is, is often heavily overstated. But I think that you, you, these things don't grow up in isolation. So the idea that there was no influence from uh, Christianity's cultural environment on Christianity, that just doesn't make any sense. So there must have been some. Um, the, the, if you take, for example, the idea of, of the virgin birth, so the idea that Jesus' mother was a virgin and that, and that she conceived miraculously and, and, that, and Jesus was, was therefore um, a, a result of this, this sort of miracle, Th that seems to be coming from two main strands. One is Jewish. There was a strong tradition of uh, prophets who had miraculous conceptions. So uh, that, that, that was told about Isaac, that was, that was a story about Samuel, that was a story about um, you know, various, various other, uh, Samson, there was a story about various other great prophets and great men in Jewish history whose mothers shouldn't have been able to conceive because they were uh, infertile or because they were too old and miraculously conceived and therefore the son was, was someone amazing. It was, it was a, a way of signalling that someone was a great man um, touched by God. So for this story to be told about Jesus actually makes sense. They're, they're effectively saying he's like, he's like Isaac, he's like Samuel, he's like, he's like uh, Samson. Um, but there's another strand, which is the Greco-Roman strand. And so we've got various stories about various great uh, Romans and Greeks who were also miraculously conceived. So the the uh, the, the story of, of Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, apparently the god Apollo visited his mother Asia in the form of a snake, uh, some real Freudian imagery there, and she she miraculously conceived. And so effectively, Augustus, according to this story, was actually the son of Apollo. Um, so, so there were miracle conception stories in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, uh, theology, and and also in the in the Jewish tradition. Jesus, the Jesus story seems to have come from both those strands. What about Paul being a nice Ben and nice? I don't see any reason why Paul would be a nice Ben and nice. <laughs> don't, don't know where that comes from. Yeah. Early Christianity being divided into three different branches. Um, uh, well, I wouldn't say three. There, there, there were almost as many Christianities as there were Christian communities. Uh, this is a period where you didn't have the internet. You didn't have. It was very difficult to communicate over long distances, and so each of these communities grew up. Christianity spread through cities. It was very much an urban religion in, in its first or urban sect in its first couple of centuries, and and so quite often you had very isolated. Um, communities of Christianity that were developing their own ideas and what often happened when they came into contact with each other is that they were comparing notes and going well we don't believe that at all and this is where this idea of you know the, the, the idea of heresy came about where well, they really had to uh, as, as, the, as the religion got bigger they had to kind of sort out well what is the real uh, truth and and they had to and therefore there was a lot of conflict and eventually the form of Christianity that we know today was the the one that survived the the, the survival of the fittest. Why well, is there a book called Titus after the Roman Emperor Titus Flavius? If he's referring to the letter Titus, it's not told after the Roman Emperor Titus Flavius. I'm, I'm thinking this guy might be trolling us there. Oh man, he's pulling our leg the whole night, man. You know what? <laughs> um, <laughs> yo, and he's serious as it says, man. He's Is he? Okay, all right. Fair Why enough. does it matter whether Jesus existed or not? 
Well, it doesn't matter to me. I, I, I couldn't give a fuck. Uh, and this is something I say to, to people all the time. People go, you really want Jesus to exist? No, I don't. don't care. You know, I don't believe that Jesus was God, obviously. I'm a bloody atheist. So why do, why do, I, why do I say that I, I think it's most likely he existed? Because that's where the evidence seems to point. Now, if someone came along and presented me with a good mythicist argument, and I've been examining mythicist arguments for about 25 years now, then uh, I'd be more than happy to change my view. I mean, I changed my view about Christianity. <laughs> I could change it again. Um, so I, I don't care. Why does it matter? Um, I think it matters that we should pay attention to where the evidence most likely leads. And I, th I think it's also important. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking as an atheist and a rationalist. So when I'm talking to my fellow atheists and fellow rationalists, what I say to them is, if we say we should be paying attention to what the evidence says, we should be leaving emotion out of it and so on, then we should practice what we preach when it comes to Jesus. And there's a reason that non-Christian scholars, almost all, with about 10 exceptions in the whole world, agree that he most likely existed. And that's because that is the most logical uh, explanation. It doesn't mean you can't come up with um, ways, in, other ways in which you could you could uh, have Jesus, the stories about Jesus arise. And that's why, you know, Carrier's book is like 700 pages thick with multiple uh, appendices and footnotes. Yeah, you can make the argument. I just don't think it's a very good argument. I think it's contrived and I don't think it's driven by a desire to, to get it right. I think it's driven more by a desire to uh, have a big stick with which to hit Christianity. Hey. And I understand, I understand that. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Christians. You think if you carry a, a lie detector test, you would, you would come back saying that he believes Jesus exists, man? No, I think he definitely doesn't believe that Jesus exists. I think he, I think he's quite sincere. Oh. I, I just, I, I, and and I think if anything, I think that's part of the problem. I think he's so convinced that um, that that he actually starts from that premise. So some of his arguments only work if you start from the idea that Jesus didn't exist and work your way back. So he, he talks, for example, where, where Paul talks about Jesus as being from you know, descended from the seed of David. So a descendant of David. Now, in all references, all uses of that, 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 that terminology, spermatos, it, it's always referring to descent from another human being. But Carrier can't have that because that, that basically destroys his entire thesis. He has to have Paul believing in a celestial Jesus who was never a human at all. So he goes through some very convoluted arguments about a cosmic sperm bank in the sky and Paul believing that that God took sperm from, from King David's testicles and stored it in the heavens and then created Jesus out of this sperm. No, there's no evidence for any of that. But Carrier invent, has to invent this convoluted argument because otherwise his thesis collapses and he does that all the time this is why people i mean i'm, I'm sure richard carrier is a very very sincere and nice guy and lots of people like him and lots of people find him convincing i just don't right i, I just don't find his stuff convincing at all i actually have him on monday this monday okay he, he doesn't like me by the way so <laughs> you should probably not you should probably not mention my name <laughs> he doesn't like anyone who disagrees with him though he's he's a funny he's a funny guy in that respect let's not let's not let's not dwell on that yeah. Um, was Preston John the same equivalent to Jesus or Paul during the 15th century to the Ethiopian Orthodox churches? Um, before you answer that, I don't know if Brother Ray knows that Preston John was a fictitious character. Yeah. So oh. Preston, Preston John was a, was a figure that uh, pops up in lots of medieval, uh, lots of medieval literature. There was this idea in in Europe in the Middle Ages that that somewhere out in in the wilds of Asia, there was this there was this Christian king called Prester John, who was going to uh, was going to meet up with or link up with the Christians in in um, uh, in the Holy Land and help drive the Muslims out of out of um, out of the out of Jerusalem. So this was around about the time where the Crusades were starting to go wrong, and they they uh, lost Jerusalem in the Third Crusade uh, in the Second Crusade. And they were fighting to try and get it back. So there was this idea that there was this ally somewhere out in in Central Asia, who one day was going to turn up with this great army. And there were forgeries of letters, supposedly by Preston John, which circulated around in Western Europe. 
where, where they, they were addressing the Pope or addressing various kings and saying, I am Prester John, the, the, the great Christian king of Central Asia, and I'm going to come and, and help you guys. Um, he never existed, um, or at least not, not what they thought. Prester John seems to be based on a Mongol Khan. So after Genghis Khan um, conquered most of Central Asia, uh, his empire kind of got, got divided up amongst some of his descendants. So there were various sort of sub -cans. One of these actually converted to a form of Christianity, formed to, converted to Nestorianism. And so it seems that Prester John is kind of like a, you know, like a game of telephone, you know, a rumour uh, that somewhere out there there was a Christian king with a great army. Um, unfortunately for the, the Christians, he, he never actually turned up to, uh, to defeat, defeat the Muslims. So Prester John is... You know, largely a fictitious character. Uh, he then became part of the folklore of a whole lot of of various churches, including the Ethiopian church. Uh, but there was there a Prester John? No, not really. But would you think that would you would you agree that the Eldad the Danite and the fact that he brought up back the whole lost tribes thing and the glory of being a Jew? Yeah. Added Prester John to his story in 600 years later because yeah. I guess the Christian was like, they got their elder to die. Let me get my Prester John yeah. point because the system, if the Prester John story didn't exist, this is my personal theory, by the way. Nobody's okay. theory. If the Prester John story didn't exist, which is true, that they the, the Portuguese were looking for gold. And they were going to Preston John, and while on their way on the west coast of Africa, there was a guy by the name of Adahu the Moor who told them, if you guys release me, I will flood the shores with Africans. That was the beginning, actually, of the transatlantic slave trade, which, okay. is, which is real. And I'm saying without the Preston John gold story, the, the Portuguese wouldn't be looking for gold. Sure. Um, the 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 interesting thing is that the legend of Prester John kind of just just kept um, taking on new forms throughout the centuries. So when it became clear that there was no Prester John in Central Asia, people went looking for him in other places, including, as you say, the Portuguese, you know, in in West Africa. So the the, the idea it was a bit like the story of El Dorado. Some somewhere out there, there's this great guy with lots of gold, and and if we find him, we'll be rich. Somewhere out there, there's this great city, and if we get get there, then we'll be rich. And and this, this, these stories kind of just keep coming up, popping up all, all through history. So yeah, Preston John was was a very powerful idea for centuries. Um, but where he was and who he was and what he was just kept moving, <laughs> depending on depending on who was uh, who you're talking about. Yeah, good, good, good point. I forgot that point. That was a very important point. Depending on what time of the year. <laughs> Um, um, could just say that's one hell of a stretch, Garfi, but it's the truth, it's not a stretch. That's who the Portuguese were literally looking for. They were looking for President John and gold. That is true, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you please ask what is Mr. O'Neill's favorite or most interesting philosopher and theologian? Richard Carrier, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, I'm a big fan of the Stoics, um, so the ancient Greek and Roman uh, philosophical school of Stoicism. So um, Epictetus is, is probably one of my favourite philosophers, and, uh, and, and Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, who was a Stoic philosopher as well, and Seneca, uh, who was a great, great Roman uh, Stoic philosopher who was also the tutor to the Emperor Nero. These are really interesting guys, and the, their philosophy is very much about what's the best way to live, um, how can we live a, a good life, but also kind of like a, a noble and ethical life. Um, what what do you what? How do you cope with the fact that life can sometimes be really shitty? And and I love the philosophy of like you you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you react to it, and that's the core of Epictetus and, and the core of Zeno, which was the, who was the founder of the Stoic school. So I'm a big fan of the Stoics, but I'd, I'd say Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. I give a copy of Marcus Aurelius's meditations by my, my bed and uh, try and every, every morning when I wake up, I open a page and just read. And it's really interesting. This was his journal that he wrote in every night before he went to bed. 
and it's really personal stuff. Some of it is a little difficult to kind of get your head around unless you understand the philosophy, but some of it you just read it and just go, wow, that's totally applicable today. And uh, I, I had one of my team at work saying to me, you know, you're quite a wise dude. And I said, <laughs> I said no, I'm not. I'm just, I'm just telling you all this stuff that guys came up with thousands of years ago. I'm just plagiarizing it. Sounds like I'm coming up with it, but, you know, Epictetus and, and, uh, and Zeno and all these guys came up with it a long time ago. Hey, um, Tim, would you do a debate with Richard Carrier? No, look, I'm often asked that, and, I, I, and my answer is no. And that's not because I don't think I, 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 I could, you know, I, I could make a good argument. I think I could. Uh, I just don't think debates. I know lots of people like them in YouTube land, but I don't think debates are actually a good way of, of, uh, of, 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 of settling these sorts of questions. The, the problem with debates is they're they're really good for debate for for discussing kind of something that, that's a reasonably sort of small conceptual idea. So should freedom of speech be uh, completely free or should there be limits? Right? So you can have a debate about that and, and people can put their views and, and you can bounce views off each other and people can walk away and think, yeah, okay, I, maybe I've, I've changed my mind a little bit about that. Questions of historic, historicity, so questions of what happened in the past, uh, are actually dependent on grinding down through lots and lots and lots of very fine detail to, to have a proper debate about the existence of Jesus would literally take weeks. I don't think many audiences would sit and listen to a debate that would go for weeks because you have to go, there's the argument, then there's the counter argument and there's the counter to that and the counter to that. It, it, and it gets down, 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 down on every single fine point. So what I find when I listen to debates about, the historicity of Jesus is that largely exercises in rhetoric, and and Carrie is pretty good at at you know coming out with great pronouncements and making it sound as though what he's saying is very very plausible. And people who don't really know the fine detail behind what he's saying often walk away very convinced. But I, what I often say to people is if, if you look at uh, those who find people like I, I shouldn't keep singling him out, but people like Carrie are convincing. They tend to be the people who don't have the technical background, the the linguistic skill, or the knowledge of the of the material that they would need. And if you look at the people who don't find it convincing, they tend to be the people who actually do have that background. What does that tell you? So I, I don't think debates are a very useful way of of uh, putting light on this. I think what they generally do is um, they give people who already believe one thing or the other. Um, uh, justification for continuing to believe one thing or the other. I don't think they change anyone's minds. I don't think they're useful. So no, I, I think there's better ways to to look at this. And I'd encourage people to go and read the articles on my blog. Go and read his articles on his blog. They're pretty pretty extensive, and and make up your own mind. But be careful because if you don't have that deep knowledge, you you should probably say I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think people coming to, to conclusions on the basis of having read one book or two books is really dangerous. What's the real link between Jesus and Serapis? So Serapis was a, uh, a, a god uh, whose cult was very popular in the later period in, in Egypt. And he was sort of a, a synthesis of the Greek god Zeus and and uh, it's debatable as to which god, but either Horus or, or Amon-Ra. Um, very popular in, in Alexandria. There was a big temple to Serapis in, uh, in Alexandria, the Serapeum. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was quite a, a prominent sect. What's the link between Jesus and Serapis? There isn't one. But the reason some people think there is, is that there's one reference to, uh, to, to the religion in, in Alexandria where, uh, I haven't got the quote in, in, in my mind, but where, where someone is saying, well, some people say I'm a worshipper of Jesus and, I, and, and then they say I'm a worshipper of Serapis and there are other people who say I'm a worshipper of Serapis and they say they're a worshipper of Jesus. Some people interpret that as saying that Serapis and Jesus were worshipped as the same guy. What it's actually saying is that people picked and choose what cults they, they accepted and sometimes they uh, were able to hold, you know, accept two cults at the same time. In fact, most ancient religion, you weren't exclusively a, a follower of any particular god. You followed whole lots, you know, a whole lot of them. You might have a particular devotion to one particular cult, but you, you, you might use different gods at different times in your life. And some people saw Jesus as just another god. 
So that's why there was a reference to some people saying that they were worshippers of both Jesus and Serapis. But no, there wasn't a connection between Jesus and Serapis, other than the fact that both cults were kicking around at the same time in the same place. Well, six crucified saviors. Um, there, there were, there are actually no other saviors who were crucified. This is a re reference to a book by a guy called Kirsty Graves, who was writing in the 19th century, and he claimed that Jesus was just one of um, 16 other saviors who were crucified. And this is all. Uh, he, he built this whole sort of edifice of parallels between Jesus and other gods. Unfortunately, uh, most of those parallels are nonsense. Unfortunately, Kirsty Graves made up some of those parallels. And uh, and no, uh, there, there are very few uh, genuine parallels between Jesus and other saviors. There are some. Um, you know, the, the God of Dionysus, who I suppose, that he turned water into wine. So, yeah, there's some parallels, but not very many. And uh, none of them were crucified. Uh, and, and none of the ones that, that died rose from the dead, and none of the ones that came from the underworld uh, did so after dying. So, unfortunately, that's all 19th century stuff that no scholar takes seriously, no true scholar takes seriously these days. All right. Hey, Tim, we've been on for almost two hours, man. So yeah, that's why I'm tired. <laughs> what I'm going to do is, and you're just waking up, it's funny, it's morning in Australia. And it's nighttime at, um, he's like 16 hours ahead of our family. So shout out to Tim. It's weekend. He's on, he's in Saturday in Australia. Yep. And, are, and by the way, how is, how is Australia as far as the atheist movement? Uh, look, Australia is very different to America in that no one really cares about religion much here. We've got a bit of a religious right, but it's not really prominent and uh, it's not, terribly powerful unfortunately it's getting a bit more powerful because the conservative party here is taking a lot of its cues from the republican party in in america and and so it, unfortunately it is becoming a lot more prominent but in australia like no one cares about you being an atheist um i, I don't even tell people that i'm an atheist because no one cares i don't know anyone who goes to church uh, I don't know if they do, they don't talk about it. So all my friends are atheists. Um, about 30% of the population of Australia has no religious beliefs at all. And most of the rest are pretty casual about it. So is there a big atheist movement? No, not really, because it's not, it's not an issue. You know, I, I think if I lived in America, I'd probably be much more active and you know, militant. Um, but in Australia, I don't need to be because it, 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 the Christians just don't have any genuine political power and hopefully it'll stay that way and and you, you're not worried about craziness happening in australia right you feel safer there than new york <laughs> um <laughs> the the uh the, the, you, you do occasionally get yeah we got our share of crazies but they tend not to be religious ones yeah, uh, it's yeah, pretty rare. from you right um um, I would say this, right? That I would love to have you back on um, where we could have, I'm, I'm going to have a methodology Fridays. So I might need you like probably nine weeks from now or 12 weeks from now. So you could go over some methodology and way how we could come to a conclusion, whether it's Jesus, whether it's Paul, whether it's Preston John, whether it's whoever, how does how do scholars come to a conclusion with a strong? And by the way, to ladies and gentlemen, when you're talking history, you're talking probability. Probability, yeah. And we need yeah. to think of that. I heard, um, I got that from Bart Ehrman years ago, and it, you're thinking about the probability of something being happened likely, and you're looking at the prob probability as far as percentages and so forth. This is why <laughs> carrier use. Bayham theory. The Bayham the theory, yeah. He, he takes that whole concept of yeah, probability yeah. To, to, to something of an extreme, I think you could say. But, yeah, look, I'd be happy to, to have that sort of conversation because what we're talking about there is is the historical method, so historiography, how do, how do historians make that those kinds of determinations. Look, I won't pretend to be an expert on that, but I've certainly done a lot of reading on it and and was trained in, in the historical method at university. So yeah, happy happy to come back on. Look, I'd really like to thank you for having me on. I think it's it's been interesting. It's always good to talk to people from 
you know, who are coming at this from different angles. And if, if I was a little dismissive of some of the questions, I suppose it's because I've never actually come across some of them before. I'm still astonished by the King James thing, but yeah, okay. Um, and also I appreciate that we've barely touched the surface. So if anyone is is uh, is not convinced, fine, that's okay. I don't, I'm not really here to, to sort of convert people. Um, but I, I think I should emphasize that I'm, this is not my uh, my theory or my thesis. This is the, I'm, I'm presenting what's the mainstream view of critical non-Christian scholars. Um, some people, in, I saw in the comments something about me dismissing mythicism. Actually, I don't. I wouldn't have spent 25 years you know, reading their stuff, analysing their stuff, engaging with them if I just dismiss them. To dismiss them is to say, uh, well, that's nonsense, so I'm not even going to pay attention. I don't agree with them. And, and that's on the ba from the basis of a lot, a lot of study and reading. I mean, I've read Carrier's book twice. Um, so, it, it, I, I, you know, I need to, to stress, if mythicists had a good argument that I, that I found convincing, I would change my view. I just don't think they do. Um, obviously, some people are going to disagree, but all I can say is I'm pretty comfortable with my position and the guys I've got on my side. But it, look, make up your own mind, folks, but just be careful. You need to be careful if you don't actually have a good, really solid, extensive background, then probably the best position to take is, I don't know. That's, that's probably the smartest position. Hi, Tim. Thanks for coming on. Hold on. Let me see if there's any last comments. I just got here. There's someone actually asked about a Black King James. Yes, somebody did. Um, <laughs> Egyptian. Da, da, da. Get those likes. Oh, up. Told, me, told me it was a Macedonian Greek, so that's absolutely true. Yeah. All right. So we out of here, Tim. Hey, thank you for coming on, man. You're number 11. I got Richard Carey on Monday, 12 o'clock, and we're going to talk about you. <laughs> nah, we ain't going to talk about you. All right. I'd, say, I'd say leave me out of it. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. All right, family. Thank you. Lovely, lovely talking to you, man. Right. And thanks. Thanks okay. to your audience as well. You, you, you have some interesting people. Some really good good comments. Actually, I've been reading them while we've been talking. So thanks a lot, folks. Thanks for paying attention. All See right. you guys. Yes, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we out of here. Peace and love, and I'll catch you guys on Monday, twelve o'clock. Peace.